focus on independent learners because when problem strings are presented, we're asking students to bring their schema along with them to access the problem, and then we're pushing them into a new space and teaching those habits of mind. And two. Two. Uh, Kelly had said, just noting about the discourse means that we had talked about earlier and how that can be transferred into any subject area, any like, social subject area, even, um, and how impactful that can be on student learning. Yeah, quality questions don't need to be confined to any particular aspect or routine uh, or content as well. So uh, the discourse moves are something that are certainly transferable. And three? Oh. Um, we kind of talked about this could be something we use in planning anything, whether it's writing or additional planning with our teammates. So um, anytime that we're kind of looking to take something and just build forward, thinking about all those pieces for us, that planning is, is useful um, to pull it apart and really think about where we want to go as we build. Mm -hmm. yeah, whether we're speaking to students in first grade who are learning um, how to be more fluent with addition, that, that structure of learning can be applicable to students, but also to adults, and also to systems. If we think about, well, where do we have access right now, and what is that next step for us to grow, either individually or as a community, too? That's a structure for thinking and learning. Thank you. So our agenda is pretty straightforward today. You'll notice that um, we're going to take some time to explore where we've been over these last few months. It feels like it's been a long time and a lot's happened since we were last together. We're going to unpack some of those experiences with problem strings to create common understanding together. Um, then we're going to have a fishbowl opportunity where Kelly and I are going to plan two different uh, problem strings. And we are, we're also going to have facilitators that get into our brains and ask us some questions to help us think more deeply about the planning process. Third, after we model a fishbowl and what it might look like to plan a problem string, we're then going to offer you some space and time with a collaborative partner to develop your own problem string, uh, being mindful of several of the items that are highlighted within the fishbowl. And then lastly, what are we going to do with this? If we're learning today, we are having a permanent change in our thinking or behavior. So what is that permanent change? Just tuck that in the back of our mind, knowing that um, we're conscious of being learners today. So this will not live on the screen, but it will live on the agenda next to Kelly um, throughout our next hour and a half. And moving forward, the two targets are identified on the screen. <laughs> not probably. Once again, you can see the, the, how it pairs with the, our, our agenda. We're going to take some time to unpack and celebrate the things that we've done with problem strings and celebrate those and recognize those are productive and, and those, aren't, um, those deserve to, to have attention um, and be surfaced as well. Often we are too critical on ourselves as professionals. We're doing some fantastic things with problem strings. What are those? And then what are some of those areas that we might be able to clean up uh, collectively through collaboration and providing different perspectives? That's our first target. And then our second target, once again, is clarity and planning. And the hope is that you walk out with um, at least one problem string today to um, bring back to your classroom. And we appreciate time to collaborate and time to develop on your own. So um, we've identified a half hour of our time for that today. And you'll notice those also will live next to the agenda uh, over by Kelly. As we move into our first item on the agenda, I'm wondering, Marcus, if you might have grabbed these sticky notes that were originally in that bin? I cleaned up the bin. <laughs> okay. We're going to need to use those in just a minute. Yeah. Great. I will go get those. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving into our realities, we're going to take a moment to tackle that first learning intention, which is reflecting and learning from our experiences so far. And the way we're going to do this is we are going to individually reflect on our successes and our challenges. And we will, in a moment, have some sticky notes for you to use uh, for this. And you're going to think, what are some successes I have? And I'm going to write one down, stick it down. Another success, stick it down. Maybe move on to some challenges I've experienced with problem strings. Write it down, stick it down. Write it down, stick it down. When your table has finished your individual reflection time, you're going to take a moment to read just all of them and just place them in the middle. After you've read them all and placed them in the middle, you are then going to move into categorizing them. So maybe these are about planning. Maybe these are about 
um, engagement, right? You're going to put them into categories, and you're going to put a one-word label on each of those categories. Okay. I offered the couple of examples of planning, engagement, whatever else you might surface at your table. Be prepared to share these. We would like a common understanding of where we're at right now with our successes and challenges, so we will be asking each group to share. We have some small groups today, um, so if you'd like to combine yourselves, feel free to do so. So again, you're going to have a moment to reflect on your successes and challenges, placing one on each sticky note. When your whole table is finished individually reflecting, you'll have time to read them over one by one and place them in the middle, and then you'll move on to categorizing and label them. What questions might we have about the next 10 to 15 minutes? As soon as we have those sticky notes, we can begin. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and five, four, three. So I come back in the classroom. Two, <laughs> one. Thank you. If we could just start in the corner over here, could you please share your buckets with us? What kind of buckets did you create? What might be those labels that you added to those? Did you hear that? Sorry. Engagement, success, inclusion, and planning. Hmm. Success, inclusion, and planning. What might be some specific stickies that you had around inclusion? Um, like including all the voices that they're all, like there was an entry point for everyone. There's an mm. entry point for everyone. Okay. So that's what we call yeah, inclusion. Inclusion for all, so they notice that problem strings provide access to all of our learners. Thank you. You had a little bit different of a conversation. Is there one takeaway? These, um, we have a couple of teachers who are new to our session today. So they were kind of doing a quick, uh, as Rusty did this morning, mini, mini, mini lesson on problem strings. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, the process. Thank you. We have, we have three buckets. We have planning, we have timing, uh, we have good math. Planning, timing, and good math. Could you tell me a little bit more about that good math piece? Uh, well, we were talking about the good participation and discourse. Um, that it brought forth a lot of good math, and um, I was something that started out as a simpler discussion um, evolved into something a, a, a little deeper um, as, it, as it progressed. Yeah, so that collaboration and discourse, it takes that from that one simplistic idea at the beginning and it gets deeper and deeper as it goes, is what you surfaced there. I, can I add two cents? Of course. Um, I had, I actually did one of them in my geometry class, but I did an algebra one, just so I could fit them in in between the surveys. And um, there was one boy, and he came from actually a different school district, he's new to our school district, and he out the y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 for slope and our curriculum doesn't really focus in on that so much it's more of like, you know changing the y or changing the x they don't throw out that formula ever and so he brought that they said it i wrote it down on the board and then there was another student that was looking at it and looking at it and said oh i finally get that i never understood what those little ones and twos meant and so it was not anything that I had said, but it was because it was mm -hmm. brought forth in a different setting that they got that light bulb aha moment. And that was where I thought the whole thing felt really clunky to me when I did it, but that stuff was worth doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that different perspective and the student to student collaboration changes the dynamics when it's not just us telling them, right? Y2 minus Y1. It's making those connections between what does this mean and what does that algorithm mean, that conceptual understanding. Thank you. Next group. We had student discourse, systematic engagement, and planning and implementation. 
So that was student discourse. Systematic. Systematic. And engage systematic and engagement. Systematic engagement is the third. Run me back again. <laughs> Number one, student discourse. Okay. <laughs> Two, systematic. Three, engagement. And four, planning and implementation. Okay. So out of those four things, the planning and implementation, I'm interested to hear more about that piece. Um, there were um, this. That was. Um, the concerns or the struggles that this group is having, and some of the struggles were um, developing the problem strings um, and finding time to implement them with a mandated program, um, or just having time specific to. Mm -hmm. Finding time within our days finding time within our planning. We've heard that a few other times here, right? That makes me excited for the work we're about to do next around our planning and our fishbowl. Marcus is helping us out with scribing some of our thinking up here. And how to develop them. They're tricky, right? I, I like that how you describe it as clunky. It feels clunky and then you get that moment of aha and you're like, oh, this is why we do it. Thank you. Thank you. Next one. Our three areas were classroom discussion informal assessment and preparation. Classroom discussion, informal assessment, and preparation. Could you tell us a little bit more about your informal instruction conversation you had? Yes, we, we all decided that we use our problem strings to kind of get a feel of the class. Um, it, it's great because all the students have access with the entry points. I know even in my class, like for the first two problems, I'd be, everybody's hanging with, we're there. When you get to the third and more, um, you can kind of see them drop off. Mm -hmm. uh, but it gives you an informal assessment of the ones who are dependent and don't want to keep thinking. Or are they really stuck or do they need help? Um, sometimes we notice that the kids pick up on the content faster than what we maybe would have expected and kind of lead, lead you into, we don't need to review that, let's go on to the next part. Um, and we just kind of, you can kind of just tell the kids who need to work on certain strategies. So. Mm -hmm. All aspects of formative assessment. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that, it's the second or third time I've heard that dependent to independent learners, right? We're tying that back to the morning session and how these problem strengths really lend themselves to giving them those tools and strategies to become more independent. But also helping you notice who is those, who are those dependent learners in our classrooms. The reason I'm asking more probing questions on certain ones is just so we can get a feel formative assessment wise for where we're all at as a group and also to surface these questions um, now so that we can bring them into our fishbowl and our planning later. All right, we have a couple groups left. Okay. Um, our categories were participation and sharing, multiple ideas, and confidence. Mm. Participation and sharing, multiple ideas, and confidence. I'm really interested in that confidence piece. Um, just thinking about you know, this kid's idea, like builds up and kind of like starting low and then building up to what they already know and what they can grasp that, add on to what they're doing okay. and what they see other people sharing out or doing. So it allows them an opportunity to build that confidence? problem strings. That's one of the nice things about those helper problems is it does start out with them confidence. That confidence there, you know, and you can um, show them how to build upon that. Again, dependent to independent. Right. Thank you. Our Hudson Bill crew. So we did skills, intent, access, engagement, and then because we tried to keep it to one word, we did a hashtag, and we're doing this right. <laughs> okay, tell us those one more time. So it's skills, uh -huh. intent, access, engagement. Hashtag, am I doing this right? If you say it fast enough, it's one word. Yep. Right. right. <laughs> am I doing this right? Um, I noticed you have a lot of sticky notes around that. So could you um, voice to the group what your conversation was around your hashtag? Mm -hmm. um, well, it was, we kind of were in a lot of different places. Um, one of us was saying that um, 
sometimes we get to a point and we just don't know where to go. Either the kids know all of the information or it's too hard at some point where there's no conversation and it just kind of died. Um, sometimes we're running into it being a little bit too long. We don't want to chop it off because it's such great content and it's great uh, discussion but it's been 20 minutes and now I'm moving on to 25 and you still have math lessons to teach. Um, and then uh, squeezing it into the correct spot in the unit. Sometimes we kind of look back and we think, oh, I should have done a number talk on this earlier or that would have been a great spot for that. So just, I don't know, kind of a collective second guessing of this is new, what is the supposed be, mm -hmm. uh, what's it supposed to look like, I guess. So what is that vision? What is that end goal? How is this supposed to feel? When should I be doing this? All those questions we're all asking ourselves every day in the classroom, right? And our last group. We had three, we had planning, we had student voice, and then we had effectiveness. Planning, student voice, and effectiveness. Could you tell us more about student voice in your conversation? We've talked a lot about discourse moves today. I liked Jason's um, reflection this morning on the one who's talking the most is doing the most learning. Um, so keeping those things in our head, what were your guys's, what was your conversation around student voice? Molly take this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, I think we all had mentioned um, about like allowing students to have their voice heard, um, allowing the teacher to help position students, um, even like students owning their content and, and um, sharing the story of like a student after a number talk or after this problem stream saying like, can I take a picture of that? Like I want to, I want to own that. I feel like this is part of my work. And so um, the mathematics <laughs> coming from. And, and really being driven by student voice versus teacher voice. Our problem strings are student-centered, and because of that, they're really taking ownership of this learning. And we created a new word. It's mm. number standing. Number standing. Understanding? Number standing. Number standing. <laughs> the purpose of this activity kind of trifold. First, we wanted to attack our first learning intention of reflecting on, upon our learning and our experiences and those successes and challenges and develop clarity around what should be considered when planning problem strings. So that's the next piece we're going to move into. We also had that NCTM standard this morning around collaboration. And we're all here to do our best every day. So sh being able to open up and share those challenges and successes and collaborating around those together um, will be our goal today. What are you noticing up here, Marcus? Uh, thank you, Kelly, for <laughs> pushing me. Uh, I'm, I was actually just trying You're to synthesize or um, provide an organizing paraphrase for what's been offered up here. And a couple of the themes that, that I was hearing from the group is really um, the independent learner came up. Um, confidence, the quote, builds up what they know by adding on to what they learn. I heard owning the content, student-centered, uh, understanding. Um, Participation, right? We explored mathematics, so outside of the habits of mind, so to speak, the mathematics, conceptual, conceptual understanding is being developed, and the framework that's provided by problem strings of here's our scaffold and here we, here's how we learn and push into new spaces, um, develops a more thorough understanding for students, and we know that's where retention comes from, not in isolation. So, it sounds I view this as a celebration, and I think all of you should as well. Um, we're we're in our infancy and in exploring problem strings, but for us to already be feeling some of these components of it is really, really powerful. Me, you. Tag team. Um, so we are moving forward in our agenda to the fishbowl process. So now we had some questions around how do we know if we keep going or when do we cut it short? What does planning actually look and sound like for this process? We're going to split up in just a moment into two different groups. We'll have the elementary group like we have before and the secondary group over here. Uh, I don't think that middle school is going to be an issue for us since we have one representative and I've asked Bethany to help me with the secondary group. Um, I know, surprising and sad. 
<laughs> um, really to offer perspective and, and what we are thinking and what we are considering as we develop problem strings overall. As we think about elementary, there aren't yet resources that are directly tied to problem strings, so Kelly has done a fantastic job of developing these on her own throughout. But I pushed myself with a secondary group and I did not use any of the resources that were used for secondary and I put myself in your shoes and saying, I don't have these resources, what would I do as well? So we're trying to be as authentic as possible um, and make our thinking visible for you so that you might be able to um, broaden your perspective about what could be considered with our problem strings as well. There's a lot of power in multiple examples, so we're, we're going to split up in just a moment. Um, what this will look like is Kelly will be sitting down with the facilitator, and I'll be sitting down with the facilitator over here. Um, feel free to circle around us, whether you're standing up or you find a seat. Um, this will be about a half hour process, and we're gonna take 20 minutes for us to plan the problem string, and then 10 minutes at the end for uh, questions and answers. Um, so that'll be an opportunity to dialogue. We are gonna be using the structure that was provided in our previous meeting as well. So these are some items for us to consider. Um, this is the planning document that Kelly and I both will be using, and you will have access to one as well. Um, so this is the structure that we'll be using for our conversation. Okay. What questions might we have about the next half hour? Great. As always, um, elementary teachers are particularly flexible, so <laughs> figure out the seating arrangement, what best meets your needs. Secondary group, I think we'll have five or six um, of us in totality, so we'll be back in this corner and we'll also make our own space. I wanted to take a look at the standard first, and I was surprised to see that third grade standard, I taught fourth grade prior to this, a third grade standard is telling time to the minute on a clock. Would you guys like these now? I intended to use them um, for when you start planning, but would you like to take some notes? Or maybe yeah, just no. to look at it to okay. see what it's Sure. Let's pass them around. And they printed with two papers, so mm -hmm. use the second page as you'd like. <laughs> So an end of year expectation, I'm just going to keep talking while we do this, we're short on time. Um, so the purpose of the problem string is to explore elapsed time. The third grade standard is time to the minute and elapsed time to the minute, which I was shocked at. That's pretty hefty for third grade. So I'm just going to make a quick note here. And then the next step on there is what might success look like in the form of a problem. And I think about, I think back to like fourth grade on a good old math expressions test, right? And how um, it looked something like Jimmy went to basketball practice at, or basketball at so and so time. He did two activities, warm up a game, and what time would it end, right? So that's my idea in my head of what the challenge might look like at this point, because also jumping back to where um, the third grade teacher was, is they're just kind of getting into this, you know, elapsed time idea, so they wouldn't quite be at that, you know, end expectation yet. I, when I plan, I like to start with the challenge in the quicker and then work backwards. Um, so I just kind of write these down here for myself. And when I think of the clunker, I think of M-step, right? What would M-step do? <laughs> really mess them up. So for the clunker, I was even thinking, I remember watching my kids take the M-step, something like Jimmy went to the carnival, you know, from this time to this time, and they'd have like 55 activities listed, and which activities might he do, you know, within that time. So for our purposes right now, I'm just gonna write like kind of a M-step type question for the clunker. Um, I have that in my head already, so just M-step type question where they have to like kind of, like the drag and drop, right? Fill in multiple activities to cover the time. Okay, so after that challenge and that clunker, I head back to the beginning and I think about what models and what representations might help support this work later on. And the models I think about, like telling time, right? And kids even know what a analog clock looks like these days. <laughs> um, telling time, right? Maybe offer up a clock 
and just have them tell it hard like to the five or ten right not make it to the minute and then what other model might I be able to offer really a digital clock and add some minutes that one can be trickier because students can just use math right but maybe even just like a it is three oh seven you know what's 30 minutes later not even making them go over that next hour So the, f sorry if I'm jumping around, but that's how my brain works. Let me know if you have questions along the way too. So with the first problem, my um, purpose would be to offer the model of seeing that clock in their head. Okay, some kids work that way. They can visually see that clock and they can see those arms moving. The next one with offering a digital time and adding a certain number of minutes is really practice with that. Um, it's not even really the algorithm. You know, the time algorithm is so tricky because it's a base 60 system and not a base 10 or 100 or whatever. Um, so practice just adding minutes and really what it looks like, the, you know, with the dots and everything else. So I have a clock. I have the digital. I love number lines. And that is the biggest helper um, with time for kids. So offering up a number line. <laughs> and if you think of elapsed time, like there's elapsed time problems where you have the beginning time and they tell you the elapsed time. There's some with beginning and end and you have to figure out that elapsed time. Um, and because I gave them the elapsed time the second time, this will play around with having a start and end time. Sorry, I'm trying to like describe this and talk out loud at the same time. It's trickier than I thought it would be. Um, so give, here's A, here's B. What is that jump in the middle? Okay. Thinking this through, I know these are flexible based on where my students are at. This isn't my exact classroom. I would know more about where my students were exactly at. But my biggest um, piece here is that I want to offer those multiple models so that later on when we get into more challenging problems, they can use those as reference and use those as strategies. Thinking about time for these, these three I would just kind of whip through. Quickly, I think about time and engagement. So, right. So, right. So, even like a yeah, let's make that up. Mm -hmm. Ooh, four. What did you say? Four thirty-two to four fifty-seven. Okay. So just having to, you know, subtract or add up those minutes, yeah. I like to have five or six. I really like six because it's visually appealing. <laughs> um, thinking about engagement of students, you can kind of leverage that. Um, so just to recap, I really start with what I want them to be able to do and then add up, go up to that clunker. In third and fourth grade, it's easy because you can throw them crazy M stuff stuff, you know, all day. And then jump back to how am I going to support this, right? From there, where do I go next? I could add two more problems. I know that I want that challenge problem to be something like Jimmy. I don't know why I like Jimmy. Jimmy goes to basketball at five. 30. He practices for, he warms up, you don't have to change the words. He warms up for 15 minutes and plays for an hour. Mm. 
When does basketball end? That makes me nervous. <laughs> oh, are you? Okay. Is it better that way then? Sorry. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Like, how long, um, when you're actually doing this, would it take? Like, about how many minutes? Okay, let's really think that through. I see this being quick. Like, show me your thinking fist when everybody has a strategy or two for telling that time take the answer if we're doing it right it's going to tell me something if there's more than one answer on the first problem right so it should be just one answer done move on um the next one should be easy move on same thing the next one really i want to make sure that all students can access that and it's simple and easy still it's just giving them multiple ways to think about time kind of the brain warm up for time um, so these three I would expect to have done in five minutes, seven minutes. And then my idea behind this, I, I'm so used to number talks, right? I'm used to not letting them use paper and pencil. So my idea, thinking this through, is that with that MSTEP type question at the end, that would be the time to offer them paper and say, go find partner and figure this out, right? And even have it written down on the paper, you know, kind of a little task, mini task, go figure it out and then come back together that way. Um, so I expect that to be taking uh, 15, you know, 15, 20, yeah. And maybe even 15 minutes to work on it and, and an extra 10 minutes, you know, it gets them up and moving so you can make that conversation longer and more valuable. Um, so, yeah. Could mm -hmm. you ask them to illustrate with one of those types of strategies that something you mentioned? Yes, I did not mention that. Um, with word problems, my typical rule is you have to solve in two ways. So show me two different representations of why that works. Um, without actually like typing it out, you know, and coming up with these problems, it can be a little bit trickier. Yeah, that's up for you to decide and who, you know, you know your students and what they need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, can I yeah. tell you real quick? Yeah. So I noticed the time frame you put on there, and when I was thinking about the time frame, I mean, you're up towards 25, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Are you doing another lesson after this? Is it building? That's what I was just thinking as we were talking about this. This sounds like math for the day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That sounds like math for the day. Um, you can obviously structure these differently to make them shorter. I know I've watched, you know, Josh, you did yours in what, 15 minutes, your problem string the other day. So up to you. Um, and it just kind of depends on, it goes back to your purpose of the problem string, where you're at in the unit, all those questions we just came up with up here, right? Um, so thank you, and let's get more into that in just a couple of minutes. How, like, we have a specific method we're supposed to use. How do I fit that into what I'm supposed to be doing? You have a specific method you're supposed That's to be? Math curriculum. Math curriculum. Use. Okay. How might these strategies fit into that math curriculum? What grade do you teach? First grade. First grade. So addition and subtraction, yeah. right, within 20? Yeah. yeah. What are some strategies that you're supposed to be teaching based off your curriculum? Um, well, we've done number bonds, we've done like, eight groups of ten, mm -hmm. um, we've done, I can't remember, we've done so much of it. Mm -hmm. um, but those are the main ones that we've done. And then uh, we moved on to subtracting two, which mm -hmm. is groups of ten. Um, but I guess I could do this case for my higher kids, you know, more independent work. Yeah, or even do it whole group on like a review day, and you're offering all of those strategies that you're teaching based on your curriculum in those first few, and then your challenge might be something that you see on their unit test, and a clunker would be taking it a step further and see what they do with that. Uh -huh.
that Would that fit your vision a little bit better? A little bit. So then I wonder how you take it down. Yes. You know, what's the most challenging and pressing thing right now, and how do you scaffold it okay. with a problem string? Oftentimes, uh, So what we're surfacing is a lot of our curriculums give us really difficult <laughs> material to work with. And I know in fourth grade, sorry, I set a timer for myself so I wouldn't go over and now we're going. Um, like the fourth grade word problem curriculum, like I would have to read them two or three times to figure it out with math expressions. Josh, you can back me up on that. Yeah, <laughs> We've been there with you before. Multiple problems wrong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And so one way to utilize these problem strings is to take those big crazy problems that you'd never have to solve in real life and take it down a few notches. And how do you bear that down and build up to it with different strategies? Interesting. Yeah, Carrie, and then I'll get to you, sorry. So I kind of just wondered what role would any type of direct instruction play into this or not at all? Like, you know, if we really time, we assume we've already taught how to tell time. Already taught how to read a digital class. It's already shown because we're building up to something. Mm -hmm. We're assuming they know the first. So, like, you're, what if you have those couple kids that still don't? They're like, but I don't remember how to do. That. I mean, like, are you just like, no, nope, that's not the purpose of today? You know. Mm -hmm. So, within those first three, not all students can access those. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming in any classroom there could be a couple. Right. Things. And what's the value in them watching it? You know, and what's the value in that conversation? Mm -hmm. Would you offer turn and talks then? Would that help them to be able to access it? It'd, it'd give you more time on your plate, you know, here, but if that's going to allow those students to stay engaged within the activity, then, you know, you get bang for your buck there. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was wondering, but I was thinking this through, like, you could work on your own. I have always had kids that want to work on their own. You have kids who want to work with a partner. And then if anyone needs support with this, come up here and I can run a small group, you know? Like, that would be a perfect opportunity to differentiate that. Mm -hmm for those kids who have no access to that clunker at all. Mm -hmm. This makes you want to teach fourth grade again. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell John that. Um, so just to reiterate here. Oh, you had a question, sorry. Yeah, it's very similar. I just feel like, to me, the problem's really, like from my understanding from the previous uh, sections, I feel like like it's supposed to be, the question is supposed to be related and it's getting harder, harder, harder. But like, like this model, the first three questions to, to me is like three different types of way of learning, but they are actually in the same level of learning, mm -hmm. very surface level. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if that's another type of mm -hmm. problem string, because if I design this, for the first, for the starter problem, if it's a visual mm -hmm. nice stuff, like if it's just clock, maybe the rest of my problems will all like be that kind of visual thing, but it's just get harder, harder, mm -hmm. harder. Okay. And the second, another like string would be a number, like a number line one, like from the pieces, get harder, harder, and then reach the same purpose, like target of questions. That's my cause, like confusion is mm -hmm. I don't know if, are you trying to teach them different types of strategies or are you trying to get them deeper understanding of something? I would argue that there's value in both of the ways of doing it. If you're trying to get them to deeper understand a single strategy, 
great. You know, if you've already taught those strategies and you want to just take the entire concept deeper, this might be a way of doing it, you know? So I think it's flexible in that way of how you create it yourself. So this is like mm -hmm. a comprehensive one. Like, you're trying to put everything mm -hmm. they already know and to do a review and maybe just one more question to enhance that. Yeah. I like that way that you said that comprehensive review, you know, and maybe even like a midway point of the unit, you know, review. And it's a great, we surface that, it's a great formative assessment for where your kids are at. Mm -hmm. And can we even hand, handle the challenge? Do I not even attack the clunker today? You know, are we going somewhere else with this? Um, and how to work up to that clunker. We're all thinking about how do we build in that M-step prep. So. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, so in time management, you might be able to do more of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it was. Yeah. I was thinking. I think that's the joy and the hard part about these is that they are flexible to what your current needs are mm -hmm. and time constraints and everything else. You can make them fit any of those things. But then, hashtag, am I doing this right? Right? It's always that question of, am I really doing this right? What would be your next image be? No. That's what I was going to get to. So we told time on a clock, and I would probably have that to the five minute for the first one. So let's say like 115 or 125. Don't give them a 15, that's too easy. 125, 307, and then add 30 minutes. So they're still having to stay within the 3 o'clock hour and apply that. Mm -hmm. you know, over to the 37. And then the third one does get more complex in that they have, they could use addition or subtraction, multiple strategies. That might be a good one for a quick turn and talk um, to share a strategy there. Of, are you gonna add, are you gonna subtract? How are you gonna find that difference? Um, do you see different jumps? Are you jumping to 42, 52 and adding five? Are you jumping to 52 and adding 20, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of jumps they're taking, that'd be a great spot for a turn and talk, in my gut feeling. And then we have that challenge problem of going to basketball practice, 15 minutes, one hour. But really, I don't know that I would add another one. Because this would be... Like, I guess I, as I'm looking at the um, second grade, we did just a little bit of a last time to five minutes. Mm -hmm. So I would probably do one more or something like that. 950, maybe 15 minutes, or mm -hmm. 20 minutes, just so they had to think, go over that hour. So maybe. I, really hard. I see another number line. That's always my default, though. Did you see a number line or did you see something different? Um, see now, I wouldn't see either one because I would give leave that open for them to some mm. kids to say, I did it on a number line in my head. This is what I did. I tend to not use visuals and wait for them to give the visuals. Okay. Um, so I probably would just write it as a problem. Um, we went to lunch. Okay. Today we're going to lunch at 11:50. You have 15 minutes in the cafeteria. What time will they dismiss you to go to recess? Mm -hmm. And to where you give several items. These are number line that looks like this. There's a digital, there's an analog. Mm -hmm. Still giving them access because you're not technically to the challenge or the poker mm -hmm. quite yet. Give them access to going over the hour so that they maybe are more successful than in the challenge or the yeah. yeah. So we went to lunch at 11.50. You get to eat for 15 minutes. All too realistic. Shove that food down. <laughs> yeah, what time? Um, what, time? What, what time do you have to leave? leave? Yeah. Well, and they don't have to leave in 15 minutes, but that's the first. They have to stay in the cafeteria for 15 minutes. So in 15 minutes, so the that, cafeteria mm -hmm. says, you may leave. So that makes me think, so we have helper, helper, helper. So I guess if I had done these, then this one, they could pick and choose how they right. would make it. Right. So a midway challenge. And then that makes me think, for that challenge problem, I need to change my times and make it more difficult of times. I gave it way too easy. Um, and then that would be the challenge where they have to add on two times, right, and give an end time. And then that clunker. 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, we did not. What might success look like in the form of this problem? Success would look like students being able, for me as a teacher, um, I want students to be able to access that challenge problem today. Clunker, just for fun, you could call it formative assessment, see how they do, throw it out, see what happens. Um, I want people, I want them to be able to access that challenge problem. What might success look like for them? Depends on your group. I mean, with this, if this is kind of like a midway comprehensive formative assessment that they're trying to access, you know, that challenge that they're not just zoning out. Maybe I would tell them today, you know, your learning intention is to be engaged with elapsed time. Now that you're successful, if we never give up, or something around perseverance. Um, it's hard for me to come up with a content one, not knowing these kids, well, to be and honest. not knowing mm -hmm. like, where you're at in mm -hmm. teaching this. Have you been doing this for a month right. now? And right. now you're going to do this out there. Right. Is this the first day? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some sort of engagement or perseverance or something around that. And what problem could stretch them? Always have stuff. <laughs> so I noticed your plan was not linear. In here. Starting at the top, and then you back up top, and then you're down here, and then it's always that evaluative piece. Is that typically how that goes for the planning process for you, or do some things more maybe lend itself to being linear? I wonder how the problem string that you offered with having the same strategy and just going deeper, how that might lend itself that's, to a more linear more process. Mm -hmm. Whereas this, my brain kind of works all over the place too. Mm -hmm. um, kind of lends itself to jumping back around. I noticed we had to switch around some numbers to make it fit better, um, different strategies. It would be great to have us all be able to talk these through every day, wouldn't it? Um, so I think it could go both ways, and I appreciate you bringing that up because I hadn't thought of that until you brought that up. That's more linear planning in my brain, and this is more jump all over the place. Mm -hmm. You remember yesterday, oh, and then you're, you know what I mean? So-and-so is going to do this, so I need to build this end up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a great point for those that collaborate with colleagues. I mean, what my colleague is doing the next day on their number string can look very different from what I'm doing based on the needs of my classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's good with you bringing that up. I'm remembering that we get an author, and she talks about sometimes how she starts at the end of her story. She doesn't always go mm -hmm. from the top of that story mm -hmm. from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so, like, doing that, that is... That's the tricky part. I okay. when I'm creating them a lot of times, I, I meant that middle problem first. Because mm -hmm. I want to say, this is what I want them to know. Yeah. And then I back up to mm -hmm. the entry points, and then I develop my clunker. So that's kind of how I, mm -hmm. I make okay. it. Do you still have something? No. Okay. So things that we've surfaced, models of support. Um, managing that time and that engagement, is this going to be my whole day? Can I make this into a 10, 15 minute thing, opening routine? I love that they call them an opening routine because I feel more often than not, these are not opening routines. Um, and access for all, how are we managing and leveraging that access point? But also, how are we, are we doing it around one concept? Are we doing it as a review? They have so many purposes. And it just depends on where your kids are at and what your needs are. Any last questions before we try to wrap this up to give you planning time? No, I really like this, that they can um, work in partners, that they can you know, have a pencil paper, that it's not just all verbal. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that was one thing I noticed too. I was never letting my kids talk or write things down, except for maybe when they get to the clunker because I didn't know if that was hashtag am I doing this right. <laughs> I didn't know if that was part of that, you know, that discourse, that discussion. So I'm glad that that was surfaced. Yeah. We often forget about that as elementary teachers because we're so used to living in the world of number talks where no pencil and paper, ever. 
Hillary, I was telling my group, had me, um, when she came to our building, had me, um, for one of the problems, I think it was a clunker, that um, they they did it as like an exit ticket. And mm. then I could kind of, yeah. you know, go through and just, because we'd already done a lot of work together, and then I could just kind of see where everybody was. Yeah. So. You see it as a formative assessment. Um, if you could just stay here, we're going to introduce the next thing and then we'll kind of pair off from our elementary group here. Thank you, Brittany, for helping us out. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you could. Thank you. We didn't have time to get to the sticky notes. Oh, we didn't either. Um, who might be willing to share a few of the items that surface from your conversation and then we'll do the same from the secondary group and see what overlap there might be. Um, but I feel like there's, there's value in our conversation and, and we're curious what, uh, what your dialogue was around as well. So maybe we'll get two items shared from both the elementary and then two from the secondary group as well. So please think about what maybe a, two of those takeaways for you might be. So who might be willing to share from the elementary group? What maybe do you have more clarity in at this point? Mm -hmm. Thank you. One, and then we'll look for one more. Thank you. Two. <laughs> one. I kind of like the reminder of kind of using a backwards assessment model to start with the clunker and working backwards. And I think that and then thinking about it just top down, and just the way they are released on the board, I think, when you're delivering. Mm -hmm. So that was a very nice reminder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Clarity in that backwards design, once we have that structure or process, that's helpful for us to be efficient in our process. Thank you. Uh, we talked about how you know, students can turn and talk during these, mm -hmm. students can write things down, especially if they get to the clunker, that those aren't rigid rules that you need to stay by, especially if you're <coughs> noticing um, as you go along that maybe things are a little difficult or you notice that you're losing students. Don't just abandon ship, but you know, make that the teacher move, even if it wasn't frequent. Yeah. Part of the structure with problem strings is that we need to stay on course, yes, but more importantly we need to read our students as learners as well and accommodate um, turn and talks and time to process as well within that. We have the freedom and flexibility to do that, um, but also following our path um, with problem strings specifically. Great. Thank you. And then two from the secondary group. I guess just for being the first one, or first time being here with the problem or problem streams, what I notice is that a lot of it looks like just good lesson planning, like you're thinking through what you want your students engaging with, and it can look like, we were just mentioning it, sometimes it seems like it's gonna look like a lecture, but it doesn't have to. It's just what is it they're gonna engage with, and you're really being purposeful about each question you're posing to the students. the learning sequence. What do they have access to? Where do we want them to go? And then how are we working backwards in that? Um, and we had, the conversation was brought up of, we don't want this to feel like a lecture, so uh, what opportunities can we open it up and allow students to um, engage through those turn-in talks or through that productive struggle as well? And two. Sorry. No, I was gonna piggyback saying, we had also talked about how like some kids need to write it down, some kids don't, giving them that option Maybe it is a turn and talk or, you know, like just it has a little bit more flow of that structure on how to keep those students engaged mm -hmm. and continuing to move forward mm -hmm. with their understanding. Yeah. So a couple levels of engagement could be turn and talks. Another level could be um, chorally reading responses during the helper. Um, another example might be allowing students access to the scaffolds, whether it's concrete materials or leveraging um, the models, the visual structures as well. So those are all opportunities to act, give students access, but also promote engagement um, in the problem and the, the higher order thinking as well. Thank you. So we're going to transition forward, and um, what this will look like, um, we originally allotted a half hour, but that will put us to the very end without the closing. So we'll take 20 minutes, and we're going to partner up but before we partner up, we want to give you time individually to explore what a problem string could look like in your classroom. So 
So similar to what potentially was modeled, what does success look like for your problem stream? What scaffolds and models are you offering as supports? What facilitation moves? So this is an opportunity for you individually to get your thoughts down and recorded. And after you have time, probably five minutes or so, to unpack um, your thinking, then we'll ask that you partner up with somebody different from um, someone in your own building to provide a, a thought partner and a different perspective. So then the two of you will take some time, maybe five or 10 minutes, to explore the first problem string. So let's say Kelly and I are partners. I take five minutes to get my thoughts visible. After that five minutes, Kelly then comes over and she's my thought partner, and we explore how we might be able to improve access and understanding um, of my problem string. After we're, you're notified by Kelly and I to transition, then I'll go over and be a thought partner for Kelly, and then we'll collectively um, develop her problem string overall. So we want to give both autonomy and choice through this process, but we also value different perspectives in supporting us and moving forward too. So we'll pair you up in just a moment, but what other questions might we have about the next 20 minutes or so? Great. Okay. Um, Kelly, you just want to take the group? Perfect. We'll come back together uh, roughly 2.50 to um, work with you at that time too. We want to make sure that we, um, we can get to the next couple steps to make sure that we can not only internalize the learning and productivity in this space, but take that energy and momentum and apply it outside of this space as well. So some of those vehicles for support are within Google Classroom, and actually our intent was that everyone would post in Google Classroom the success that you had through building this, but that sounds like it would take more than five minutes. So we're going to move past that. But we are encouraging you to post in Google Classroom around your thoughts and ideas and explorations as you go through because not only are you benefiting, um, you're pushing others' thoughts as well. Okay. So knowing that we had quite a bit of time to just unpack that, and we might be willing to share one quick item. That, how was this process helpful for you? What was helpful for you? Yeah, Adrian? Uh, it was really helpful to start with um, the Seems like the, the two themes that we keep hearing today is that backwards design is really helpful and giving students access and progressing forward sequentially is a productive way to, to learn. Okay. 